You know, I have a reverence for wood. I always have. And when I find a board laying on the ground, I can't help myself but look at it and see if there's something that's hidden in there. I've got a board that I found laying around over there and I looked closely and it's got nail holes in it. It was a piece of trim. It was something that, uh, I'm not even sure where it came from, but it was laying in the junk pile. And I thought, you know, is this something that should be used as firewood or thrown away? Or should I take a closer look at it and pull out all those nails and clean it up and maybe run it through the planer and uh, see what kind of value is hidden in this piece of dirty wood? You know, I, I look sometimes at old houses and fences and things that were built, you know, 30, 40, even 50 years ago. And the wood that was in those buildings or those fences are often of such a high caliber that you can't find that kind of wood anymore unless you disassemble something that is being thrown away. So I'm going to take a little bit of time and you know, look at those rings. That is an old growth piece of, I'm not sure if it's fir or redwood. It's so dark. It's probably redwood because it's been sitting outside for a long time and I don't really see any decay in it. It's going to take, it'll probably take me about a 15 minutes or so to clean it up. Getting all the dirt off of there so it doesn't mess up my planer is going to be a challenge. The nail holes and little dents and all that kind of stuff. Well, we'll just call that patina. <laughs> so I extracted seven finishing nails from this board. And because they're finishing nails, that tells me that this was likely an interior board at one time, but I have no idea how long it's been sitting out in the weather. So I've wiped it all down. I've cleaned it up to the best of my ability with a rag. And there's still a lot of embedded dirt in there. So I think I need to go to a brush. You know, a scraper does a really good job of not tearing up the grain but cleaning up some of that dirt. And it does it really quickly. This just took me just a couple of minutes to do this. I hit it with a broom first. I wiped off as much as I could. I wiped it down with a rag. So, you know, a lot of you are saying, you know, why are you putting all that effort into a board? You know, just go buy another board at the lumber yard. Well, it's not that it's just buying another board. It's the quality of this board. And some of you are gonna say, well, what are you gonna do with it? Well, it's not so much what am I going to do with it, it's preserving a piece of wood that when I need something of real high quality, I have it in my stockpile. Yep, there's a lot of gunk coming off of this, but once I get it clean enough, then I'll run it through my planer. You know, when you're dealing with an old piece of wood, you have to ask yourself, what do you want to use the board for? And as I said before, I wasn't quite sure, but when I started looking at this, I kind of liked some of the old barn wood like patina that's in it and the grain is really interesting. But also I thought, you know, if I run this through the planer, this is going to make this look like a brand new board. And sometimes retaining that old aged look on a board makes the board useful in different ways. Now, for instance, let's say I wanted to make this board into a picture frame showing some old black and white images from the 1800s, that would give the picture much more character because it would be an old, old looking frame. Now let's say the picture was of my family standing around the old horse and buggy or the barn or the mule, that would give it even more character. So don't see a board as just a board. Think about what you can do with the board and how you can capitalize on some of these boards that you can no longer find. So it is important to get all the dirt and all the grit and everything that's going to ruin your cutting edges um, out of the wood before you start processing it. And, and the planer is actually um, a, a tool that you absolutely do not want any grit or dirt in there because you'll tear it up. So I kept working this board and I thought I'd, I'd put a, a rabbit on it just to 
expose the grain. I started playing with it more than actually utilizing it because I was really interested in the age of the board. So I took one edge and I sanded it down with a piece of tape on it just to clean it up, just to get a better idea of how old it is. And sometimes I'll use really, really fine meshes. What that will do is it'll bring it up to a polish that makes it very easy and very uh, clear to, to read the age of the, of the board by counting the rings. It's kind of cool. I've got a whole bunch of old antique nails, and sometimes I'll take out some nails and I'll use them for something. In this case, I'm going to build a, uh, a small shelf with some hooks on it for keys. Um, polish them up, and that's what you get. You take something old and turn it into something you know, nice, then you've got the age and the patina and the, the character of, of the hook, but uh, something different. I'm kind of fast forwarding here to uh, my grandson Parker, one of my grandkids. Uh, he was talking to me about making a Father's Day present. I said, okay, well, let's go out and play in the shop. And I thought I'd take this as an opportunity to teach him a bit about tools. So here is a, a hand plane that I gave him. I restored it and cleaned it up and sharpened it. Keep that clear. It. You know, it's, a, it's an old Stanley. It's actually an old Bailey um, number four. And I told him this plane is worth at least $100, so take good care of it. And I also taught him about uh, using a handsaw. Now, working with a handsaw is a, a lost art that most adults don't even know how to do. You know, there's, um, there's a skill to using a handsaw that... Uh, unless somebody teaches you and shows you how to use it, you'll never really understand it. I've heard many people say, I can't follow the line for the life of me. So what I did is I scribed a nice straight line on here. It was parallel with the edge of this board. And I told Parker to follow the line. And he did the best he could. But, you know, what you have to do is if you're teaching a a child or a grandkid to to work some of these tools, you have to work with them and show them exactly what's going on. Then I explained to him what a rip blade was. That last one was a cross cut. And this is a rip. Rip is where you follow the, the length of the board. And it's got a different tooth configuration altogether. And once again, I, I scribed a line and said, follow that line perfectly. Use the full saw. There you go. If you're not using the full length of the saw, it takes you twice as long. You're starting to push. You're going to break that top off. Relax the saw. I don't want to see this move here at all. Okay, so you, at the end what you're doing is you're kind of bending the saw a little bit. So relax your hand. Relax your hand. Watch this. Don't let that move at all. Long straight shot. I don't want to see you break that off. There you go. Better. Way better. You still put pressure on it, but you have to learn that relaxed hold. Really relaxed. You're following the line perfect this time, Parker. Just take you off just a tiny bit, but that's easily fixed with a hand plane. Remember what I said about the end here? There you go. Nice. Perfect. <laughs> Let's see. Well, close. It's a little, it's a bit, little bit thick on this side. It tapers down. Not bad. Not bad. There's the line. So you started at the top and then you kept going a little bit to the right. So what that was telling me is, is you were putting pressure on the saw just a little bit this way and you weren't relaxing and letting it follow the cut every single time. But that's a skill and it takes a while to learn that. Right. Good job, kiddo. <laughs> a little bit off. That's your Father's Day present for your dad. Good job, Parker. <laughs> I started woodworking actually when I was a boy. My grandfather was into woodworking and so was my uncle. And I started collecting tools when I was probably about 16. So my entire life I have spent collecting woodworking tools, especially hand tools. And I have an affinity to antique woodworking tools. Something about the romance of how they used to do it, what life was like back before we had power. That just really appeals to me. And I featured this tool in quite a few of my 
woodworking videos. This is called a spoke shave. Now this spoke shave dates back to the 1700s and all the components on it are brass except for the steel in the blade itself. This is uh, one of my prized tools. This tool has adjuster knobs on the top and the way it's worked is you can refine a piece of wood. So you could cut a piece of wood down quickly, get a rough shape with the, the draw knife, get it all down close to it, and then do all the refining work with something like this. So I hope you enjoy this. Uh, please share it. Uh, if you know woodworkers out there that are interested in this sort of stuff, um, I, I think they would enjoy it. And subscribe to my channel. Thanks a lot. Stay safe out there. And go out in the shop.
So I'd like to share with you some of the tools that I have collected over the years. And I believe that a lot of you might find this quite interesting. I mean, I'd like to take this for example. Isn't that beautiful? I won't go into that right now, but I'm going to explain what that is and how it's used and why it was such an important tool. I have lots of homemade tools. I mean, that's a valuable tool right there. Really valuable. <laughs> but I've also got a lot of tools that span centuries. My oldest tool dates back to the 1700s. I've got a lot of early 1800s, some early 1900s, most of them in the 1800 range. And then, of course, I've got a lot of newer tools, the steel tools, the, the, the tools that kind of revolutionized the industrial age of, of woodworking to a point where things changed. I believe that woodworking, especially working with hand tools, is a skill that is all but lost. I mean, there is a small percentage of the population of people out there like me who really enjoy not only the romance of it, but the the understanding, the recognition of what life was like a hundred years ago or two hundred years ago. Before power tools, some of the most beautiful furniture ever made was produced. How was it done? What kind of craftsmanship was involved in using some of these tools to make this incredibly beautiful, incredibly intricate, fine joinery. Some of it is made without any steel at all because nails were not available. So they had to use ways of making interlocking joints, dovetails and rabbits and different types of ways of holding the wood together that would understand expansion and contraction. The piece of furniture has to work with climate change. And it's a different kind of climate change, of course. We're talking about Hot weather, cold weather, expansion, contraction. I want to talk a bit about wood. I want to talk about how wood is hydroscopic. And it brings in water. And when it gets wet, it expands. And that moisture just might be in the air. It just might be from when the, the season changes and it's a little bit wet or a little bit damp out. Every single piece of furniture in your house expands just a little bit. Now, there are some exceptions. Some people keep their homes heated all the time, and the home is climate controlled in such a way that you've minimized that. But we have to recognize the fact that wood moves. So the joinery, the way that pieces were put together, understanding all the little subtle nuances, like, for instance, you know, what is a, a frame and panel door all about? Well, it's made so that it can expand and contract without busting the pieces. If you put something together and you make it all rigid and, and held in such a way that when it expands a little bit or contracts a little bit, it's going to force itself to crack and break apart, that piece of furniture is not going to last. So getting back to the tools, back in the early days, people understood wood a lot more than most people understand it today. So I would like to spend some time talking about tools. I hope you enjoy this. Well, let's start off by talking a little bit about some of the earliest needs for woodworking, and that's shelter. This is a project that I helped my daughter build a long, long time ago. She was reading a book about a boy and his father who had to build a log cabin. And the school project was actually to build a recreation of the log cabin to the size and the dimensions. And she was in the fifth grade when we did this together. I want to show this to you just a little bit. I'm pretty impressed with this and Cal and I worked on this together but uh, uh, we talked a lot about how things were sold in barrels and you know how the fireplace was the main source of heat in the house and uh, so he's got a little bed over here and all the little components to it anyway more on that later that was a really really good father-daughter project so let's go back in time. Let's go back to the turn of the century. 
From 1700 to 1800, it was uh, a time where there was a lot of people going cross country. Not so many coming out to the West Coast, but for the, the middle of the Americas, a lot of people were going to the Ohio Valley and Kentucky and different areas to start their lifestyle. And one of the first things that they would have to do would be to build their home. So what kind of tools would have been taken out back then? Well, clearly the ax is probably one of the most critical first tools that was taken out there. I want to talk a little bit about the ax first. This is a very, very old ax. And if you look at it closely, it's got a name on there. It was made in USA, West Virginia. And I want you to notice that there are big rivets in this ax. And if you look at it really, really closely, you can see that there's a seam through here and there's an S on there. Somebody probably put that on there for an identifying mark. You can see this ax was also used as a, a mallet or a hammer because it's got some mushrooming over. That's never a good thing. But if that's the tool you've got to use, you used it. I'm guessing that this tool is from the, because of the rivets from the early 1800s. Now, modern axes are much, much different, but this was probably one of the most critical tools. I mean, you could use it for cutting the trees down, for bucking the logs into position to make your log cabin or whatever kind of a structure you wanted to make. But you got to think about lumber back then. Lumber wasn't as readily available as it is, you know, after the Industrial Revolution when either steam power or water wheels or some kind of machinery was made to manufacture lumber that people could make conventional type housing. Now that was available, but you have to think about when the pioneers went into a new part of the world. It was a new world. They, there was no lumber. There weren't any stores. There weren't any places that they could buy stuff. So the tools that they purchased was probably just the head. Now, the handles were not often sold with the tools because most of the early woodworkers, they made their own handles. They would have to go out and rive some really straight grain quality wood. Now, here's a piece of ash that I've split out and I've been waiting for it to dry. This is going to be an ax handle. It's a nice straight piece of wood, so I'm probably going to use this for a double bit ax handle like this. You see I have tape on this because this one is razor sharp. This has a straight handle as opposed to more conventional axe handles that have a fawn's foot on the end and a curve to them. You know the shapes of axes were very very unique and we can go into that the axe handles. I mean the shape axe handles were very very unique and a lot of people did their own custom axe handles to fit their own grip but their own style and they put a lot of thought into not only the straightness of the grain, the lack of any imperfections in the wood, such as a knot or a crack or a weakness, but also the way that they shaped it and the way that they, they, they worked it. Because you have to think about it. You'd be using this tool sometimes all day long, and it's going to be slipping and sliding in your hands, and you want it to be something that's going to not only last, but be a pleasure to work with. Now I mentioned the double bladed ax. This is actually something that came along during an era of logging where they just had two man saws and axes. And you ask yourself, why did they go to all the trouble of making two blades or two bits? They call this a double bit ax. Well, if this is the tool that you're working with all day long, you want this ax to stay sharp as long as possible. So at the end of the day, you brought it back and you sharpened it and you had it ready for the next day. Two bits, you can go twice as long. You've got two sharp pieces. When you're chopping those big wedges on some of the giant redwoods or giant fir trees in the logging era, a double bladed ax was really important. Nowadays, there's not a whole lot of call for using a double bladed axe unless you want to be the romantic and go out and do it 
old school style. And I welcome that you try it. I think that that would be really fun. I have used this axe many times and it is, uh, it, it does take a bit of time to get used to it. And it is a little bit challenging, but um, you don't find these too common. Uh, you can still buy them in hardware stores, but the purpose of a double-bladed axe, most people don't understand. You know, they, they think it's kind of cool to have it, but why two bits? So let's talk about building our cabin. We go out to a remote area, we find a piece of property that we want to turn into our homestead. And there's lots of straight trees around, so we start off by chopping them down with the axe. We may have a two-man saw or a one-man saw. That wasn't not that uncommon back then. But now that you have the logs on the ground, what do you do with them? Well, you've got to prepare them. And another very valuable tool was an ADZ, A-D-Z. This one's got K-W on it. I acquired this from a good friend of mine who passed away. And there are ADZs of different sizes and different shapes for different purposes. There's a great big ads. You notice I've got tape on the ends. Once again, these are all sharp. Now these tools were used to flatten one face or two faces of a log. And a lot of times you'd stand, you'd straddle the log and you'd have this tool right here that you'd swing like this as you go, being very careful not to catch yourself in the shin and you'd work your way along and you'd chip and you'd chip and you'd chip because if you had a log that was rounded all the way up to the top, you didn't have a very good set of contacts. Now they did do a lot of completely round logs, but those would expand in contraction. They'd have to put a lot of stuff in the cracks called chinking. More on that later. But this was a really valuable tool because you could make big beams and big straight level edges. Another really valuable tool that was used quite a bit was a slick. Now a slick is a huge chisel. And once again, they were usually sold without a handle and they would have to either carve or shape a new handle to put in here. This is a handle that I made for this old slick. Okay, so the value of a slick is a way of refining that long straightened edge that you've made with the adz, because the adz is pretty rough. You could also use a draw knife. That was a very common tool. I'll talk about that in a bit. But the slick, the slick could be, you could have a timber even down on the ground or up on some sawhorses, and you could work your way along to flatten that edge and smooth it out. It, it kind of works a lot like a plane, but a bit, um, a bit more aggressive, a bit rougher. You could either work it bevel side down for a finer cut or really get aggressive. And you could work your way all the way down a good piece of timber and create a nice big curl. Now slicks come in different sizes too. Here's a smaller slick, here's a bigger slick. I've seen slicks as wide as four inches. Uh, this is a two inch, this is an inch and a quarter. Once they get down to about one inch, they're called chisels. And those are used differently. And there's a whole different assortment of different types of chisels. This is an interesting chisel right here. This is called a mortising chisel. I want you to notice how thick it is and how strong it is. And the tang goes solidly into this really, really good boxwood handle. This is an old chisel that came from England. It's in great shape, but this was meant to be used with a mallet for pounding out mortises, or you could use it for working into edges. You could do a lot of things with a solid, solid mortising chisel. A whole chapter can be done, or a whole video could be done on just this one tool. Kind of giving you a little bit of a brief synopsis on a whole bunch of different types of tools so you can get an idea of where I'm headed with this series of videos that I want to do. So let's get back to our cabin. All right, we've spent several months chopping and working the logs and we've got this built up framework. Now we need a roof. So what did we do for a roof but make shingles? 
and there's a valuable tool called a fro. Once again, sold without a handle. You had to make your own handle and fit it in here. And a fro, you would take a chunk of wood that is cut to the length of the, of the, um, the shingle, the length of the shingle. And most shingles back in the early days were, oh, as much as 36 inches long. Nice straight grain, good quality wood. It could be made out of cedar, out of redwood. There's a whole bunch of different species of wood that are relatively decay resistant, that would last longer. And what you would do is you would strike this on that piece of wood that's on the ground and you would hit it with something like this that gets really beat up. And you would lever it over to pop a shake off of. And you'd get really good at being consistent. So you'd want them about, oh, a half inch, maybe three quarters of an inch. And you would pop them onto that piece of wood and break it off. And of course, you'd have to form that piece of round to the size of the shakes that you're trying to make. And then you follow it with the grain. And you work your way across. Some of them are a little narrower, some are a little bigger. And you could make shakes for your cabin. Now, it might take you a few weeks to make enough shakes to roof a cabin. Because it's a lot of work. I know, I've tried it. It's really hard. And I have so much appreciation for the skill involved in learning how to use this tool. Now, once you've worked everything together, you may have to pin some pieces together. They didn't use nails that often back then because they were expensive. And they were called cut nails. They were square nails and they were cut in such a way that they broke them off one piece at a time and they were tapered down usually just on two sides. The other side were the thickness of the metal. So a lot of work was done drilling holes and one of the tools that they would have used way back when is a hand auger. And this hand auger is quite old. This probably dates back to the 1700s and they didn't have a lot of steel back then so they used a lot of brass and all the components of this are made in such a way that this could be used for a while. But the construction of this was somewhat uh, limited because you have to remember that this, the grain of this piece of wood goes like this. So from here to here is short grain. So this piece expands and contracts. And if you look really closely here, you can see that both sides of this are cracked. Not only are they cracked, they're, they're cracked right where a screw was installed. So that fractured the grain. So you have to remember that over time, wood expands and contracts. And that little weakness right there, not only using it, caused this piece of wood to fracture, to break apart. So there's not a whole lot of these around. These have been replaced with steel versions, more like this. And there's many, many, many different sizes of braces. These tools were used for drilling holes. Now let's go back to this old brace. Now the old braces had a square spot to hold the bit. And back in the day, all the bits had a square end. And they were tapered and they fit in just like this. There might be a little wedge that they'd tap in to hold it into place. There was other ways of doing it, but in many cases it was just tapped in and held in by pressure. Now this particular bit is not what would have been used back in this day. It would have been more of a, of a spoon bit. And unfortunately, I don't have any spoon bits. They're straight up and they've got kind of a rounded top piece that's sharpened on one end and it kind of works its way around. And they're much slower. This is called a spur bit. This is more of a um, I think spur bits came out about the mid 1800s or so. This was a very val valuable tool and a lot of these people that would be going out to build their cabins would have had some way of drilling holes for a lot of reasons. Maybe you needed to put pegs on the wall. I spoke a little bit about the draw knife, but there's another tool that I want to talk about. It works much like a draw knife, but it's a lot smaller.
Now, most of the early pioneers wouldn't have had a tool like this because they didn't really spend a lot of time refining their woodworking. They were more crude. They were about farming and ranching and, and just getting it built. So they would have a lot of the other tools that I talked about. So I'm going to wrap this up. I hope you enjoyed that brief little uh, introduction to antique woodworking tools. Uh, I would like to spend some time and do a series of videos and feature some of these tools because I have so many tools to share. I, I literally have hundreds and hundreds of, of antique woodworking tools that I understand and I know how to use. So I hope you enjoyed this. This is a bit of a longer video, but you know what? We're kind of hunkered down right now with this uh, COVID-19 deal going on. So I'm spending quite a bit of time in the shop. 